My name is Stone Fleshman, and yes, it's my real name. Many of you might already be thinking that this has got to be a testimony of a soap star or a porn star. Oh, let's be honest. Luckily for you, it is one of those, sort of. <laughs> I'm super excited to tell you guys my story because I feel that every time I share my testimony, a chain breaks off of me. They conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb, that was Jesus' part, and by the sharing of their testimony. That's our part. I believe that our Father has protected me my whole life so that I may stand up here right now to tell you my incredible journey thus far, while giving all glory and growth to God. From a very young age, I knew I was called to ministry. I knew that I would eventually get out of that lifestyle that I was leading, eventually. But I had no idea how that transition would look, nor how long it would take. Please know that this is my story, right? It's my memories of my life. It has taken 40, oh, 45 years now. Woo! For me to get here. Uh, and I'm get here spiritually. I ask that you please not compare the beliefs that you will hear tonight to anything or anyone except the Bible. My prayer is that my story will cause no one here to judge others on their personal journey because that's not our job. It's his. God met us to where we're at, and I hope you will try to do the same with the people he brought into your life. My prayer is also that you will fall more in love with Jesus and his promises and power to overcome anything that you are, that you are facing. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. All things. Even me. Uh, never mind, I'm not going to read that. Uh, <laughs> fine, even me finding a woman sexually attractive someday. Alright? It could happen. It could happen. One girl, that's it, that's it. We're not going to go there yet. Don't cancel me yet, okay? Okay. Alright. <laughs> My mom and dad met on a blind date in Kirkland, Washington. Up near Seattle. Okay. She was beautiful, shy, and naive, and he was to quote his widow, the town whore. They got married and made me. While pregnant, my Christian mom would pray over her belly that her child would love Jesus and that the alcoholism gene carried in her father and my dad would not be passed down. And to this day, alcohol has never been an issue, and Jesus has always been my best friend. So, with the birth of Randolph Keith Hunt, Yes, that was my original name. My mom's whole world had changed. Growing up, I never wanted for nothing. I was the only child for my mom for 11 years, and my grandma seemed to think that I was the only grandchild. So I grew up with my mom and my grandma as my influences and best friend. I was a very pretty child with big curly blonde ringlets and big blue eyes. My mom says that people would stop her all the time in stores and tell her how beautiful her little girl was. I remember hearing this many times. Some would say I even have gay face. Google it if you don't know what it is. Anyway, it's just, it's, it's a real thing. Okay, so I was also a very feminine child. I loved pink and sparkles, still do, and I always wanted to play with dolls, but even as a five-year-old, I knew that what I liked wasn't already, wasn't all right, at least in our culture. I played with He-Man like all the other boys my age, but I also played with He-Man's sister, she -Ra. I would go into Toys R Us and immediately run away from my mom and grandma to the pink section. I would walk down the Barbie aisle very slowly, taking in all the glitter and hot pink. If kids were already in the aisle, I would start a weird dialogue with myself, saying things like, gosh, I wonder what my sister would like. But if the aisle was clear, I would very cautiously sit down and look at the backs of every Barbie and the Rockers, Rainbow Bright, and Gem and the Holograms boxes. I was never allowed to buy one of them, which definitely created shame. Uh, that affected my life in psyche. My mom was always trying to get me into boy things. She even... Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, good. Uh, she even tried to get me... She even promised to buy me my very own jet doll if I signed up for T-Ball. Um, I talked her into buying me this doll before practice, which caused us to be too late to sign up. So I guess she took that as a sign and never asked me to play sports again. And thanks to her prayer, Jesus has always been protecting me from terrible things like t-ball and soccer practice. <laughs> anyway. My mom ended up marrying a nice guy named John. He was super nice to me, but because of his childhood, he didn't understand fatherhood. About the time he married my mom, he also adopted me at age nine and bought the pet store he and my mom met at. Under his ownership, the store started doing very well and eventually would become the largest independently owned store in this side of the Mississippi. He would spend so much time working um, in the pet store, he would have a room on standby at the hotel next door. All the time he spent there would eventually tear apart the family. 
Mom found her identity in being a mom and unlimited credit cards, and my dad found his identity at the store and up at our lake house 300 miles away from home. So I've just recently been talking about a night that happened to me when I was between four and five. You can put up that super cute picture of me again. No, no, no. I have no teeth. Okay. Like most young kids, I was intrigued by our bodies and other people's bodies. I don't know how it started, but I would play the underwear game with the boys my age in the neighborhood. One night, my new dad's best friend came over. I asked him to play the game with me in the back seat of his car. I guess I told my mom later that night what had happened, and he ne we never saw Ken again. Three months later, Ken was arrested for molesting his two young kids. Unfortunately, because I knew that the game was my idea, I blamed myself for awakening feelings in him. Uh, and Ken, wait, and I partly blamed myself for his arrest. Now, it wasn't until a couple years ago in discipleship when Miss Diane Cannon asked me to write a letter to a five-year-old me when I realized how old I was. I, I would never blame a child for doing and liking what felt good. A five-year-old doesn't have the brain capacity to understand what's going on. I was operating at what felt safe, as well as pleasure and reward. It was not little Randy's fault, but something was awoken earlier than it should have been. So throughout elementary school, I was occasionally playing the game with friends. I would hold on to those very isolated incidents and always wanted them to occur more frequently. Around the age of nine, I had my first encounter with pornography. One week, I was feeding the cats of my neighbors, and I decided to dig into the mom's underwear drawer. And honestly, where do kids get these ideas? Like, why would I dig inside that drawer? Um, but of course, hidden in the back of it was VHS tape and two magazines. The video had one name on it, Tracy Lords. Side note, 25 years later, I, was, I had the uh, opportunity to meet her and told her that she was my first girl experience. <laughs> anyway, eventually at some point the video games and bags ended up in my bedroom, and what's still crazy is I still remember the scenes I watched the most, and that is how powerful porn can be. I mean, I was nine. As with most kids who feel different or like they don't fit in, I did everything to not stand out or draw attention to myself. I was always a little chubby as a child and would go on diets with my mom. This, of course, caused body image issues that would later just grow larger in the gay man world. It's a fact. Men are stimulated more visually than women. I never really liked the gym, but I did figure out that if you stay skinny, you could always be labeled a twin. When I got older, meth helped me stay skinny. I truly believe that nothing tasted better than skinny felt. Bless you. In the 90s, I was your typical questioning teenager trying to find his identity. I experimented with grunge flannels, rollerblades, parting my hair down the middle, and girls. I dated a lot of girls, and I'd make sure we broke up before anything serious happened. This is probably the reason I had a different girl at every single dance photo. Autumn? I think it's autumn. Okay, and then <laughs> my first experience with a dude was my dad's assistant manager, Jeremiah. He was 19 and I was 15. He we each had a pina colada wine cooler and watched Madonna's newest concert on VHS. That's how old I am, okay. Um, there was a song, I just remember this specifically, a song probably titled The Beast Within. It had Madonna speaking scripture from Revelation over a very erotic and haunting beat. During this performance, the male dancers were displaying attraction and rejection by touching and kissing each other. We decided we would learn and practice that dance that night. If I remember right, we mastered that dance scene and the extended remix. Unfortunately, we decided not to talk about our dance, which brought up more layers of shame and rejection. Um, so around the age of 16, I logged on to AOL. You remember that? AOL. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And started talking to guys in the men for men chat room on AIM, AOL Instant Messenger. I ended up acquiring my first boyfriend from there. He was my age and went to a nearby high school. We were together for three months and saw each other twice. Once to meet and once to break up. My senior year, of course, I worked at The Gap. I mean, it was 1995. There I made a lot of older friends that taught me about guy liners, shoplifting, and really what GAP stood for, Game proud. During this time, I was also working on my senior project. It was based on the thesis question of, should I come out of the closet or not? During my presentation on the last day of school, I had concluded that I was going to stop wearing a mask and come out. I took this paper mask and I lit it on fire, and I was basically proclaiming to the world that my identity would now be found in my sexuality. Which sounds amazing to the world. Okay. Later that night, 
at prom, my friend Stacy and I performed a perfectly choreographed dance to Madonna's Vogue. Yeah. As we landed the final pose, my class launched into applause. Everyone seemed to be celebrating my newfound freedom. I was finally free to be me, or at least the me that my world needed me to be at that time. There was a shift that day in my confidence and popularity. I was all of a sudden cool, and unbeknownst to me, I had also just become an example to every other gay kid from Woodenville High School. So, I decided to go to college 3,100 miles away in Providence, Rhode Island. I chose this destination because I wanted the experience of living on the East Coast for a few years. It was also easier to reinvent myself as Stone. You see, up until this point, Stone had sort of become a second identity that I had been using since I was 12. I would sign my art projects and journals as Stone. I also started using it at all my mall jobs. My mom had asked me to just wait until I was 18 to legally change it. So to this day, nobody calls me Randy. Praise God, and nobody's gonna start, right? <laughs> Amen. Okay, in college, I became super popular super quickly. I became the first freshman to win homecoming king and snowball king. I wore makeup, blurred all masculinity lines with the way I dressed, but somehow I was popular with the students. I was very kind and always had a gift to see the unseen, still back then. Even then I knew that the light that people were seeing in me was Jesus. The issue was that I didn't understand the power that kind of light can hold. And I definitely used it to my advantage, and I saw a lot of fraternity brothers, most of whom are now married. Hallelujah! All right. <laughs> as much fun as I was having my first year of college, I apparently found time to study. Because I did have a 4.0, and I was in my to attend school halfway across, uh, in Gothenburg, Sweden. I had so much fun in Sweden. I brought home two new front teeth and my very first STD. Oh, other than the crabs. So I guess it's my second STD. Not long after shampooing my whole body, I would go back to Europe and get another STD requiring surgery to remove. Amen. This was just the beginning of my relationship with STDs. Okay, the summer before my senior year, I had an internship at Access Hollywood in LA. A friend I met during the summer convinced me to move to LA by offering me a job at his job. He just happened to be a contract player on the show Days of Our Lives. So for two years, my main income came from playing a Salem High student by the name of Buddy. I got paid stupid money to stand around and grunt and nod. My first line was literally, <laughs> Still, that was not good. <laughs> that was a terrible actor. Um, of course, hanging around in this crowd thrust me into the life of cocaine and champagne. One night I broke the cardinal rule of no drunk driving on Hollywood Boulevard. Everyone knows that. After meeting Janet Jackson at a club on, you guessed it, Hollywood Boulevard, I got pulled over in my very subtle electric green Mustang convertible. License plate said Hollywood 10. Oh my God. And I went to jail for 17 hours. My behavior and attitude about drinking and drugging didn't change after this incident at all. I mean, after all, I did break a well-known L.A. rule. But it was probably not a coincidence that I was fired one month later from both of my jobs. So in 2003, my very well-known Disney star roommate and I got into a huge fight. I'll give you a clue who she is, and only a couple people probably going to get this, but oh my, see this Lupitas! No way! Hey, that's right. <laughs> So, a not so well known gay comedian moved in and introduced me to a website called manhunt.com. Yeah, one night I invited my first guy over from the site and he brought a small glass pipe thing to smoke from. I explained to him that I had never really smoked anything, I didn't smoke cigarettes, I didn't smoke weed, I hated coughing. So, he promised me that I would not cough and that the smoke would be smooth. I took one hit and proceeded to have unprotected sex for my first time. A few months later, I did get fired from both my jobs. Oh, yeah. So after being fired, I proclaimed to my top 10 MySpace friends that I was tired of all the fake people in LA and moved back up to Seattle. After moving in with my grandmother, I rediscovered Golden Girls reruns, Camomile tea, gay bathhouses, and GHB. Let me explain the last two. So GHB, if anybody doesn't know, is G. It's a party drug that if taken in very small doses, by the way, there's gonna be a lot of education in this lesson. <laughs> Things you didn't want to know, but I will. Um, yeah, it's like if you take a small dose, it's euphoric and super fun, but in any larger amount over a short period of time, the effects are heightened and it can become known as the date break drug. <laughs> okay, so now a bathhouse is a place where a man can rent a changing room with a bed, mirror, and three channels of porn for eight hours, relatively cheap. There are always more than enough guys on drugs who will freely give and share with you freely if you freely share yourself. These two discoveries would end up changing my life forever. 
I had just found a safe place to have what would later be defined as chem sex. Okay, so six months go by, and I claimed that I was too fake to live in Seattle. So now I need to go back to LA with my peeps. I moved in with my friend Nikki into a penthouse on Sunset and PCH. When I arrived at the top floor condo across from Gloria Allred, poor lady, she had to watch everything that was going on there, Nikki greeted me with a bottle of Dom and a blue plate of Coke. After a couple lines, she began to explain to me that she wasn't really a model. She told me that she actually had several girls working for her, and then used to work for the famed Hollywood madam, uh, Heidi Fleiss. So she explained that while I was living with her, I would also be working for her as her assistant. Oh, okay. But if she needed a male player for a job, then I would receive $3,000 for a minimum of three hours. And this is way back in 2005. So, um, she did that. Oh, and she changed my name. My name would be Chase from now on. <laughs> My hooker name. Right. So, as she was getting out the blue plate special, I went to the restroom and I looked intently at my face in the mirror, looking straight into my eyes. I moved my face about one inch away from my reflection and uh, started. And I, I looked at myself, I remember this, and I was like, What are you doing? Like, I'm a good Christian boy. You should not be perking for a pen. Um, I convinced myself that I would just go find a real job the next day and save all my money. After all, she wasn't asking for rent money. She was offering a room, board, unlimited amounts of cocaine and champagne, several pairs of Gucci sunglasses, and some possibly unwanted sex. Oh well, for the low price of my dignity and my body, it would only be for a month, right? Right. So after learning how to make crack and filming a couple MTV reality shows, like this terrible one called <laughs> Date My Mom, I went on three dates with three of those moms and they hoard their sons out to me. That's literally what the show is about. Um, and a couple other shows. Uh, I uh, ended up, oh, yeah, after filming those shows, learning how to make crack, breaking into an Oscar winner's house, and taking inappropriate photos with Daniel Tosh, and collecting 25 pairs of Gucci glasses, I finally moved out one year later. Yeah. <laughs> the one good thing about working for Nikki is she didn't allow any employees to use meth. For now, I was out living at a mansion in the hills with the villain from Starship Troopers. I decided the first thing I would do would be to take myself on a tour of all 14 local bathhouses in LA. Remember, I was in Seattle doing them all, but I hadn't discovered all the LA ones. And a big praise report about this is there is now only four bathhouses in Los Angeles, and this is absolutely doing to dating apps, but also to COVID and Jesus. Amen. They're gonna close down next year in Jesus' name. All right, after a pretty reckless, but super fun year, I moved in with some church friends from Oasis. The morning of February 14th, I was laying on my bed naked and thinking how wonderful it was to be skinny. I remember doing this in my bed, and I'm like, oh, wow. But then I thought, wait a second, I'm a fat kid. Like, I shouldn't be skinny. Then why does my skin feel like old man leather? Like, hmm, I'm only 27. So that night, my friend and I went to the AIDS Healthcare Foundation testing that fan in West Hollywood. I gave my friend the results she had wanted to hear, but at 2.30 a.m. I locked myself in my bedroom and screamed and cried myself to sleep. The next, mor oh my gosh. the next morning, I couldn't drive. I was in a daze. I walked four miles and ended up on the doorstep of the only other person I knew who was HIV positive, just like me. Happy Valentine's Day. So, because I thought I was going to die in a couple months, I decided to make a bucket list. Side note, I'm still here 17 years later. Oh, yeah. On that list, I, I put a red Mercedes CL take convertible, of course, and spending more time with my family. So I bought the car, and then I became a flight attendant because there was no way I was going to go move up to Seattle in the rain and be with my family. So this way I could go see them as much as I wanted. So for the next two years, I would stay with my family a couple times. Um, I elected to keep my HIV status a secret so as to not worry my family. On one long trip, I had forgotten my daily cocktail meds. I was supposed to take two times a day. My mom and I were in the car, and she could see me stress texting. I asked her some random questions about pharmacies, and she leaned over and looked at me and said, Baby, I know. The fact that she now knew was a blessing. But the fact of, of how she came to know Let's just say her best friend was at the top of my inventory list that she totally told her she wasn't supposed to. But thank you, Ciara. I have forgiven her. Yeah. Yeah. 
In the attempt to become a West Hollywood cool girl, I joined the board of HIV advocacy group called Impulse Group, which was part of AIDS Healthcare Foundation. They asked me to do a part of a campaign that had me coming out as HIV positive Christian on a national billboard. I was overwhelmed by the love and support that came out of this. I'd also just now unknowingly became the example of a gay Christian. And for many people, so too, too bad at the time though, I really didn't understand how much damage I may have caused the kingdom when I did this. Because I would very publicly declare my love to Jesus while also very publicly declaring my love for dancing in a thong in public. Yeah. So, my whole life I've been trying, that was funny, okay. My whole life I've been trying to navigate what, what being a gay Christian really meant. Did it mean this? I went to a rally, I was like, yes, Jesus loves you, me. Like, that was what my version of being a gay Christian was at that time. Um, my whole life I've been trying to navigate what that was. Um, in high school, all I knew was the Leviticus scriptures, which led to hurt and shame. And in my 20s, I was all about the born this way ideology, which may be true um, in this world. We don't actually know. But I learned later that he created me to be that way. In my 30s, I basically was what they now call a side B Christian. This means that I abstained from sex, but still celebrated and found my identity in the LGBTQIA community. Kind of like you're living in the hood, but you're not banging. So, of course, abstaining from sex. Well, I was banging. I was definitely banging. Anyway, of course, oh, but not then. Okay. Of course, abstaining from dating, but living in a sexually charged environment just made my chem sex addiction worse. So, a few years later in my fly tank career, I went on a six day Disney World vacation. After being awake for nine days, I went on this vacation. Yeah. Uh, I probably had one day of sleep, maybe in that picture, after nine days. Um, I would never recommend the Disney detox program at all. I slept on rides and in lines the whole trip. This is until I got a really bad headache that would not go away. I called my doctor and flew home early to meet with her. I found out that I had gotten another killer disease due to my drug addiction called meningitis. The good news was that I was now testing negative because of my very strong antivirals that I was on. The bad news was that my friends who were in that picture um, did not have antivirals and they were in the hospital for nine to ten days and they both almost died. So when they were in the hospital though, I did go to my very first rehab in Palm Springs for 30 days. Um, after I got out of rehab, I was obviously ready for a serious relationship, right? Right. <laughs> so I fell in love with a very, very sweet guy, also a very, very poor guy. His name was Timmy. A couple of months into dating, I decided to break up with him to spend more time with Jesus. I knew in my spirit that we were not supposed to be together, but I missed holding hands with him, and my mom actually encouraged us to get back together. I don't think she would have done this if she had known that three months later, I would marry him. Timmy's mom had been a meth addict, so I, it was very apropos that he would marry one. It only took a couple of months into the marriage until I used and cheated on him. But don't worry, he did just fine in the divorce. He got the Audi TT convertible and our dog. <laughs> Oddly enough, though, I was very out and about in my addiction at work. I actually was able to help a lot of crew members and their families get help when I was when I was at work. But with me not being a functioning addict, I was never at work if I used. Uh, during my 10 years of flying with Alaska Airlines, a pattern was created. I would fly for six months, use for one week. Do four months clean, use for one week, sleep for one week, two months clean, one week sleep, one week off, one week eat, one week eat, you get it, right? In total, I did um, seven inpatient and two outpatient rehabs. And I have to say, I did love going to rehab. You get to take a paid month off to focus on yourself. I mean, amen. <laughs> However, 30 days was never enough. Never, ever, ever enough. Um, and some of my takeaways from my rehab was just that I found out that I did meth to have sex rather than having sex to do meth, which actually meant that my root was sex addiction, not meth addiction. Um, I learned that meth can change your memories, literally can change your brain into thinking things that did not occur um, or things that did occur. Um, and then some of the effects that can also be permanent. I don't know if you noticed, but I do have lobster claws still, and I do this a lot, I walk like this, it's something that yeah, only tweakers sound that funny. You're so drunk. Yeah. I, I, it hasn't gone away, but it will in Jesus' name. Okay. Meth also affects your judgment and decision making. 
So, for at least six months, even after getting sober, people come into discipleship program who honestly don't think that they need to get clean until after months go by. I've been with people who say that they never thought about not doing meth. Never thought about it. Isn't that crazy? They just never thought about getting sober. This may all be bad news, but of course, the good news cancels that out. It just adds to the testament of Jesus when you see meth addicts sober, even for one day. It literally is a miracle. When I was playing, I was very involved with the church. Oh, this is LA. <laughs> I'm Wilshire, and they're celebrating recovery. Recovery. Roughly 150 people came every Wednesday seeking freedom. They were large enough to break off into mixed issues group, with codependency being the largest. I chose to be part of the substance abuse group, but I always looked to see who went upstairs to the same sex attraction group. They are the brothers I really wanted to talk to, but I didn't want people to think that I thought it was an issue. It was just one of my many issues I was not ready to attack. So after being fired from the airline, I had managed to lock down six months clean and sober, and I signed up for a missions trip to Uganda. And after raising the 4K to go, I ended up using three days before, and I had to forfeit the trip. The pastor, Pastor Alex, um, is, was in charge, and he's a very good friend of mine, um, and he has suggested I check out the Dream Center. So, after calling him, though, I learned the prerequisites of the program, which would be to get rid of my car, my home, and my phone. <laughs> so, I didn't come in until uh, five months later. Side note, though, this is the praise report. Five years later, just this last month, I ended up going back. I was on a mission from God. I also knew that my life was going to change forever. 
What I didn't know at the time was my family and friends were going to be affected by that decision. So many beautiful miracles happened with them while I was in the program. And the one-year program turned into three years and eventually landed into a staff position. Yeah. 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 Through some recovery and my studies at the Dream Center, I learned that I'd been finding my identity in things that were not of Christ. As secure and confident as I thought I was, it turned out I was not. I was finding my identity in my sexual preference, pop culture, my friends, clothing, relationships, and my many, many jobs. I had 61 in total. <laughs> okay. I was making idols out of these things. And of course, for those of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord, our lives then we should not should we should not have idols. You shall not make for yourself an idol or an image of anything in the heavens above that the earth below. Through my CR step study, I learned to take responsibility for my thoughts, words, and actions. That I was the only, that was the one choosing to hold unforgiveness and hurt in my heart for no reason. I honestly was able to forgive everyone in my past and present. The steps that he gave me something healthy to do on Tuesday night and also tested my patience with yeah. my new yeah. 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 But it was all worth it because I came out with 10 brothers I knew I could come on anytime. Yeah. Maybe nine. <laughs> Lately, I've been focused on what Christ and singleness looks like. Let's try that right now in the church. Okay, for those of you who are struggling with their singleness, Jesus was single, and since he was fully human, we know he struggled too. So many of us lose our identity in relationships because we didn't have a firm grip on who we are. We are in love. We are to we are to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. This means that the first we are to love God and put Him first. Only then can we begin to know and love ourselves through Him. And only after we really accept that we are a son and daughter of the Creator of the world. Can we, tend, can we begin to love other people? We tend to try to love someone else before we love ourselves. And, well, that's how many of us got here, right? But with that said, being in this room means that you are actively trying to change something about it. So, good job. You're running and you're running towards Jesus. He's right there. You're just looking at his eyes, and there's gonna be distractions and other people and next to you, uh, relationships and all these other idols. But you're just running. You're focused on him. Eventually, you're gonna look over and there's gonna be somebody running at the exact same pace as you. Someone who's equally yoked. Yeah. Amen. There you go. Now, if you've been wrestling with God over your identity being found in Christ rather than your sexuality, please don't let anything I said. Take away the truth of how much Jesus loves you. Yeah. He is the only one who knows what is best for you. Just as he died for us on the cross, we, if we are professing him, are to die to ourselves, right? We must also die for him. This is an everyday challenge, but you don't and can't do it on your own. This is, uh, if you need changing, then he's the one to do it. Not your dad, not your brother, your pastor, or that annoying aunt that won't stop shutting Leviticus down your throat. Just please continue to come to CR. Find a church that meets you where you're at and continue to chase after Jesus. Amen. He loves you and wants a relationship with you. Great. For those of you who are wrestling with sexual or lustful thoughts, whether it be for same sex or opposite sex, as they say in Christianese, everyone has a cross to bear. We all got stuff. Let's not overcomplicate the good news. Jesus loves us and he wants a relationship with us. Some of us just need to rest and listen to the Holy Spirit. He knows what's best for us. He may be asking you to stop wearing something or even move out of your place. Maybe it's to delete an app or not return someone's text. Whatever it is, check to see if what you are feeling lines up with scripture. And then jump. He's got you. The unfamiliar is going to be scary, but know that confusion and fear is not from our Father. He has designed life to need Him. If we didn't step into the uncomfortable, then we wouldn't need Him. If you know someone also, who is losing their identity and their temptations. My suggestion is always this. I tell parents this often. So, number one, show them the love of Jesus by being an example to them. Right? Through your words and your actions and your life. Number two, continue to pray for them and believe that God is building their testimony. Number three, it's also important that you don't invalidate their feelings. You can't tell someone that they are what they are feeling is wrong. You just can't. It can cause feelings of shame, guilt, depression, suicidal thoughts. Many people run away from home and never see their family again. 
We need to stop giving unbelievers news they can't handle before the good news that they can handle. I just read this in a book and I paraphrased it, but it is a great, it's an aunt's response. The aunt is part of a church and it's her response to her nephew coming out of the closet to her. And I, I just want to read it to you guys. All of us have a cross to bear, so she's saying this to him, or an issue to wrestle over with with God. That is something you have to work out with him, but you have the Holy Spirit to help you answer questions. And remember that voice of falsehood is loud, and God's voice is usually a whisper. And I'm sorry if we or the church has failed to love you. No one should bear their struggles alone. We are here for you. Whatever you come to believe about your sexuality, you are always welcome here. If you have a partner, you both are welcome here. And yes, the church has a policy which means they will submit to scripture about marriage, but if we didn't love you, we would be missing an irreplaceable part of Christ's body. You are wanted. Now, I do believe what scripture says, that I can't change God's word, that I will love you, and I will accept you, and I will embrace you no matter what. And for my brothers and sisters who are coming out to friends and relatives, please be patient with them. If you, consider that, if you consider them important to come out to, then they must love you. We can't expect people in our lives to just be okay right away with such life-changing news. Think about how long it has taken you to get comfortable with it. Try not to put expectations on people. Most likely, your parents and relatives are going to say the wrong thing. So be ready for it. I recommend telling them and then walking away. Just as you brought it up to them when you were ready, let them bring it up to you again when they are ready. And don't worry, walking away won't affect you living your truth, but it will give them time to process the news you just dropped. And for those of you who have relapsed recently, remember there's no condemnation in Christ. He does not want you to sit in sadness, shame. If you relapse, you repent, and you get back up. And I'm speaking to myself also when I say this. I haven't talked about this at all, except for a couple of good people, um, but I did relapse for one day last year. Uh, this meant that I used meth one day out of five years. To me, that's incredible. And I'm very proud of myself. And a huge thank you to my support squad and I'm able to grow up with compassion and I'm able to get absolutely no judgment. So thank you. Um, I like to give this illustration also. Again, running, which is funny since I don't do that. Um, <laughs> so when you're running a race and you trip, you get back up and you keep running. You don't go back to the beginning. So I'd like to remind people of that, because day one, going back to day one, we can get stuck in that. So you just get back up and you keep running. But with that said, please continue to take CR checks. Because yeah. <laughs> it is always so encouraging to see people succeeding, as well as encouraging to see people fall and get back up. Now, a lot of my friends from my old life, they don't understand my new life in Christ. I hope they're watching too. And I hope that they'll understand that this will be Christ's name for them. Um, the thing is, they are not ever going to understand it unless they too accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're not to be held to kingdom standards. We need to stop giving unbelievers news they can't handle before the good news they can handle. That's what they were saying. My old friends were saying and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They see me as someone who has joined a cult and is denying who he really is. They don't understand the fact that for my four, first 40 years, I was actually denying who I really was. Mm. As son of the living God, I tell my old friends that I am happier now than I've ever been, and they can't argue with me. Yeah. I tell them that just as I accepted what they have come to believe is their truth, I hope they can do the same for me. I tell them my old life in WeHo was super fun, but it also felt empty, and that my life now is still super fun, right. but super full. Come on. For most of us, being in this room means that you got up today. For some of you, maybe it was just a few minutes ago. But we decided that we are not going to do whatever. We decided today that we're not going to do whatever we want to do today, right? That we are going to ignore what our flesh and our feelings and the world is telling us is okay. And instead, we're going to listen to what our spirit wants. Being here means you are tired of the way you were living before. You're acknowledging or at least entertaining the idea that a life without Jesus at the center is empty. You are choosing to get out of your uncomfortable coping zone of isolation or anger or living in the past 
or codependency, video games, porn, fast food, masturbation, needles, maybe razor blades, and you are looking for something healthier. After being in recovery for my old life for almost five years, I still have thoughts of wanting to Netflix and chill with a pipe and a dude, but I can attest to the desire of getting weaker every single day. And I know that every day I'm getting stronger, and I'm so incredibly proud of each one of you. Yeah. So, I was giving my testimony about a few months ago, and afterwards this very, very sweet girl said, hey, can we pray the gay away? <laughs> uh, <what>? Yeah. <laughs> After the 30 or so people that were there to like pick their jaws up off the floor, I, I thought for a minute and I was like, Holy Spirit, what do I say to this? It was super awkward. But then I said, How about we just pray that I fall more in love with Jesus every day? Amen. Let's not get caught up in the details complicating the good news. The scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. Basically, seek him in all you do, and everything else will line up. So, uh, so I've had the scripture memorized. Well, th thanks, Papa. What the heck? I love that you're calling me old. Amen. Uh, I've had this scripture memorized since I was three because Salty the Songbook Tapes. You can see Salty on there. Some of you may know who that is. Um, I would also like to teach this scripture to you guys, and I'd like you all to sing along with me. I voted to do this without piano. Okay. <clears throat> Feel free to sing along. <clears throat> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 